Hello, everyone, and welcome to And Sleep, a whole youth social talk show series. My name is Tommy Likatezi. For this series, we discuss how lifestyles impact our sleep health. Today, we're going to discuss how obesity affects our sleep with bariatric surgeon, Dr. Pratiba Vamulapali. So welcome, Dr. Pratt. Um, let's talk about uh, obesity and sleep. Let's get started with that. What is the relationship between obesity and sleep? How do they affect each other? Obesity and sleep has probably the largest, most unrecognized relationship. If you think back to yourself or your family and you think to yourself, oh, do, do I know somebody who snores? For me, my husband snores. There are probably so many people out there with sleep apnea undiagnosed, and it is very, very related to weight. Now, I don't want to say sleep apnea happens only in people who are overweight, because that's not true. It's because of the anatomic way that your airway sits. But for the vast majority of people, sleep apnea happens because of weight. How is that actually affecting their sleep? I mean, people think that waking generally is your arms or your belly or your legs. So for people with sleep apnea, the most significant um, areas that they gain weight is really in the neck and in the back of the throat, right? In your neck is your windpipe. And what happens in sleep apneic patients is they fall asleep like everybody else. And you have initial falling asleep when you're lying in bed um, in the first 10 minutes. And what happens is as they fall asleep, all of the extra soft tissue, the fat in your neck, the fat in the back of your, in the back of your throat, collapses on itself. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> it's, it sounds a little scary, right? It collapses on itself and you can't breathe. But when I mean you can't breathe, it's not that you can't breathe oxygen. It's that you can't move your air in and out. And when you can't move your air in and out, the first thing that happens is your CO2 starts to rise, right? In houses, we always look at carbon monoxide. Right. In people, we have to look at carbon dioxide rising. So as the carbon dioxide rises, there's a carbon dioxide monitor in your brain and it says, wake up, wake up, air's not exchanging, carbon dioxide is rising, right? Kind of like a Will Robbins, danger, danger, <laughs> right? So that danger, danger is really important to us. With that danger, danger, we wake up. And the minute you wake up, your airway opens up and you start breathing again. And a good night's sleep for the average American is seven to nine hours of solid restful sleep sleep that you first have a light phase, you go into at least three phases of REM, that rapid eye movement where you're dreaming, and then you slowly come out of it and you go into a light phase sleep. For people with sleep apnea, they never make it into that deep phase sleep because the airways collapse, the carbon dioxide monitor goes off, and they wake up. So from what I understand, uh, the weight gain makes you sleep worse, but patients with sleep apnea, they tend to actually have trouble maintaining weight and in turn gain weight. 100%. So it seems like a bit of a, a, a vicious cycle. It is a vicious cycle. When you're tired, right? First of all, in everybody, your brain uses glucose. We can call it glucose, we can call it carbohydrate, but that's the kind of energy, that's the high octane fuel that your brain likes to use. When you're tired, you need more of that high octane fuel to stay awake, to overcome, right? It's why we, all of us love coffee, right? Coffee with sugar, because it's got our caffeine and it's got our sugar. The caffeine's the stimulant, the sugar is for our brain. What ends up happening though, when you're sleepy and you're, you, or when, you're, when you have sleep apnea is you don't get that good restful nighttime sleep. So you wake up and you're tired and you need that sugar and your brain's waking up, you haven't had that restful sleep, so you overdose on carbohydrates. And as you overdose on carbohydrates, AKA sugar, you gain weight. You gain weight, your sleep that night is even worse, you wake up in the morning, you want more carbohydrates. And imagine that cycle going on for a month. At the end of that month, you've gained five pounds just because you haven't slept enough. And that's been pretty well shown that sleep is really important to maintaining your weight. Sleep is important for so many things. So now in your patients that you're seeing this weight gain occur, um, 
you help them with their weight loss. How does the weight loss now help them sleep better? So it's, it's funny, and I, I challenge everybody to do this. Think of your friend who's lost five pounds. Think of yourself when you lose five pounds. The first thing that you always notice is people's face and necks, right? Because that's one of the first places people lose weight. As your neck starts to get smaller, as the soft tissue, right, the fat in your neck and the fat in the back of your throat gets less, when you sleep, it no longer compresses on itself. It's open, and therefore you go into deep sleep and you get better sleep. And that's almost in every bariatric patient. There have been large studies done where a year after surgery, 80% of patients no longer have the diagnosis of sleep apnea. Wow. When tested, they are not sleep apneic. Of the remaining patients, the 20% that remains, 19% mm -hmm. of them, their sleep apnea actually gets better. So if you had a severe case, you now have a mild case. And it's only 1% of people that stay the same. So in that 20% that you're seeing, those patients who either have some or none, no improvement, that small percentage, what do you do for those patients after? What's the next step? If they really are not getting restful sleep, depending on how severe the sleep apnea is, um, we first give them lifestyle changes, right? Don't eat and drink close to bedtime. Try to take all the other things that are not sleep apnea related out of the equation. Then after that, if they still are symptomatic, we usually recommend devices to them. So what we usually do is we send them to get a sleep study. And if they have mild, they can get an oral appliance to basically take the tongue out to elevate the jaw while they sleep so that the airway doesn't close. Or we, we offer them CPAP or BiPAP to actually keep the airway open with what we call positive pressure. So we always start with an oral appliance because if you can get away with an oral appliance, it's easier. There's no electricity required. I've had patients say, I can go camping with my kids and I don't have to worry about a plug. Um, so that there's a lot of advantages to an oral appliance. Uh, it's only when the oral appliance doesn't work and or they have a sleep study that shows more severe sleep apnea. Uh, and that true anatomic dislocation um, that you need the CPAP. Well, thank you, Dr. Pratt, for joining us today. Tommy, thank you for having me. This is such a great topic and an important pleasure. topic. Thank yep, you. Thanks.